the way in which we express our Islam throughout the world is very, very different. If we want Islam to continue to be relevant and to have meaning in our lives today, then we need to figure out which Islam, whose Islam. Let's find out whether there are other ways of understanding verses of Quran, or is it we are only supposed to listen to the mainstream? Women need to ask questions from the sacred texts. So far, the questions have been asked by men. And I see religion and Quran as an ocean. And each of us go to it according to our own capacity and concern. I was brought up and raised with the basic uh, Islamic knowledge. But I really, really uh, got interested in Islam when I was 15 years old. And the understanding then, what I got from the mainstream, was that a girl has to cover, you know, in order not to make herself desirous to men's eyes. A girl has to walk properly and talk properly so that she doesn't attract attention. And I believed that. I believed that no matter how good I, I, I'd be as a practicing Muslim, I would never be uh, as equal as the Muslim men because God has granted them all these rights and it's in Quran. I mean, first of all, I didn't understand why my brother did not have to do housework and I have to do housework. It just did not, as a kid, as a little girl, it did not make sense to me. You know why? Just because he's a boy, he doesn't have to do housework, he doesn't have to clean the house, help my mother to cook. So really for me, the questioning was from the family, but the family never used religion to justify why. So I always knew it was culture and tradition. Law was my interest, so I studied both English and Islamic law. And I graduated and I started working, but um, more into corporate world. But the idea of, you know, what Islam is has always been inside me until one day I decided I didn't want to do any more uh, corporate world. And I said, you know, why don't I use my Sharia degree? And uh, by chance I found sisters in Islam. When Sisters in Islam started 20 years ago, it was because Muslim women started coming up with uh, issues, access in courts, not getting their rights uh, when it comes to divorce or even maintenance for themselves and for children. A man has a right to beat his wife, a man has a right to four wives, a man has a right to demand obedience, all these things that just don't make sense to my sense of what is just and what is fair. So they started studying the Quran and from their readings and research and studies, they found that it is not true um, that women uh, have to be treated lesser than men. It is not true that God said men is superior over women. For me, it was the most liberating um, experience, you know, to go back to the Quran with feminist eyes, asking feminist questions, you know, um, and to discover the message of justice, of equality, of compassion, of men and women being each other's protector, each other's friend. Things that they studied were the same, same things that I have always questioned my whole life as a Muslim girl, as a Muslim woman. We wanted to break the monopoly um, that only the ulama, only the religious authorities have the right to talk about Islam and to define what is Islam and what is not Islam. Our position is that if Islam is used as a source of law and public policy, everyone has a right to speak on Islam. Whether you are a scholar or not a scholar, um, whether you're a Muslim or not a Muslim, you want to use religion as a source of law and public policy. What we are debating is public law and public policy and how it impacts us and our rights as citizens within a democratic nation state. We decided that there's no way that we could influence the religious authorities or go to the mosques and talk about this, that we decided then as a strategy to create a, a new platform to assert our right and our authority to speak on this. And that's how we came about, you know, the idea of using the letters to the editor column in the newspapers.
We've had a lot of challenges, intimidation from state and non-state actors. We've had 70 police report lodges, uh, lodged against us. Our book has been banned. We've had our name being mentioned in a Friday sermon. The, the Imam would say, uh, uh, calling out, you know, take action against sisters in Islam because they are against God, they are against Sharia. When Muslim women demand for change, demand for equality, we're told that this is against Islam. Um, you know, and this is divine law, it cannot be changed. We were also taken to court because of our name, Sisters in Islam. The argument that they gave in the summon is that uh, our work don't reflect at all uh, on Islam and we may confuse people. Of course, there are attempts to silence our voice, but you know, this is the 21st century, you know, with information technology, with the internet, with Twitter, with Facebook. We also have a platform to get our voice heard. Slowly, we are changing, you know, especially with the social media. People are more interested now to understand why Sisters in Islam are saying all these things. Let's find out. The new media actually provides that space for you to raise these doubts, for you to find information on your own, to, to find sites and debates and articles that actually address the doubts and the questions that you have. Now it's reached a point where whenever any issue relating to Islam comes up, the media will come to us as a source of authority. We have successfully broken the monopoly and the hegemony, you know, of the traditional religious leaders and their authority to be the sole authority to speak on Islam. One of the main sources of Islamic law is Hadith, the Sunnah, the tradition of the Prophet as narrated in Hadith. And women were among the main narrators of Hadith. You know, Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, was a major figure. And the Prophet is quoted as saying that if you want the best person to go to in terms of knowing your religion and in terms of needing information on your religion, is Aisha. By the time that fiqh schools, that is jurisprudential schools, emerged, which was about 150 years after the death of the Prophet, women were marginalized. Their intellectual abilities were really denigrated. And they were really put aside from the production of religious knowledge. But now it has changed. And I think now women are partners in production of religious knowledge. I went to England in 1974 to do my PhD, and I came back in 1980 after the revolution, and that was a choice that I made. And I was married at that time, and my ex-husband was Iranian, and I was very much for the revolution, like a large majority of Iranian women. I believed in justice of Islam, and I never, you know, felt patriarchy, I never felt religion was oppressive, but then after the revolution, we saw another face of Islam. It was the legalistic and dry Islam. I could see that all these veneers over my own society, culture, or the class that I came from of modernity was so fragile, it just melted. And then this patriarchal culture came. We had the cultural revolution, which meant closure of universities when they reopened. I went through the process of interview and selection and I was rejected and basically I was rejected because I was educated in the West and also because I did not wear hijab and you know they make inquiries and uh, then my marriage had failed and I came back to England and the reason that I became interested in Islamic law was because I had to negotiate my own divorce. I had to go to the court, I didn't have any ground, the laws had changed, my ex-husband refused to divorce. So for me, the strategy from my childhood, dealing with problems is to learn, to get information. That is why I started studying Islamic law and the laws of divorce and marriage and all this sort of thing in order to negotiate my own divorce. And I learned it well enough to get my divorce. 
But then I became very fascinated in the topic. And, and Islamic jurisprudence is extraordinarily rich. The Quran is beautiful, it's a beautiful religion. A lot of the interpretations were made by men. And in the Prophet's time and hundreds of years after his death, it was very, very patriarchal. Patriarchy existed before Islam. And Islam as a religion was unfolded. The Quran was really revealed in a patriarchal context. The main verse that the jurists used um, as the basis of family law and building a model of the family is the verse in Surah Al-Nisa, which is the fourth chapter of the Quran and verse 34. The key word in that verse is that men are qawamun of women. Qawama comes from the Quranic word. Uh, men are qawamun, um, supporters, maintainers of women. There is a, basically an the assumption in Islamic law that men are providers and protectors, men are superior, men are leaders. But the reality in many women's lives today and family life today is that men and women are partners. Women are out there working, women are providers, women are protectors of their family. What if it is the woman who is the maintainer in the family? If that be the case, uh, then a woman is the qawam. There is no permanent generic for some of them over others. The sum of them over others changes throughout history. Dans l'ancien code euh, du statut de la famille au Maroc, on, on avait par exemple l'homme était le chef de la famille. Et maintenant avec le nouveau code, grâce à une nouvelle relecture de, du concept de al qiwama et al wilaya, nous avons les deux époux sont les co-responsables de la famille. Et donc on a une lecture qui est euh, très moderne, mais en même temps qui se base sur des versets coraniques et sur la révélation coranique. The meaning of the Qur'an is always fluid. The text itself is frozen. How we interpret the text is always chosen. There are many, many concepts that renders the tradition open to change, to deal with the changing times. The difference between what is Sharia, what is revelation, and what is fiqh, what is jurisprudence, what is human understanding of the Word of God. And those who exist on the margins have the right to interpret the Qur'an through their contexts. My name is Aisatu Ture. I come from the Gambia. I am a co-founder of a women's rights organization called Gamco Trap. Gamco Trap meaning the Gambia Committee on Traditional Practices Affecting the Health of Women and Children. We work on sexuality matters and we specifically focus on female genital mutilation. I'm a victim of female genital mutilation, so I did not relate to it in a way that was sort of critical. My husband was one person who raised my sensitivity. You know, I have four kids, three girls and one boy, and my husband said, my daughters are not going to be circumcised. And I said, what do you mean? This is part of our culture, this is part of our religion. We sat down to discuss, he's a medical doctor, and he explained a lot of things that they face as medical doctors. Because of the practice that we have gone through, we have prolonged labor, you have painful labor, and also it's a distortion of the natural state of the female genitalia. So these are all issues that came up, and we saved our children. From then, I had this personal uh, feeling in me that this is where I can contribute and this is where I think I can make a difference and until it stops, I will fight on. When I started the debate on the elimination of female genital mutilation, I was told that it was a religious injunction and it was being defended by some scholars. I did my research with my team and we found there is nowhere in the Quran, nowhere absolutely, and I could not believe my eyes. 
the Quran is considered a male preserve. And because it is considered a male preserve, the knowledge that a woman has is not respected easily. So what do we do? We engage the religious scholars. At the beginning, there was resistance, very big resistance. For them, it was like a very controversial issue and undermining the whole essence of the existence of religion. I always tell them, I challenge you to go to the Quran and show me the verse that says women must be circumcised. Luckily, we have very progressive scholars like Imam Babali. Imam Babali went back to the Quran, he read the Quran and came back and said, you are on the right path. I am ready to join you. We went to the Upper River region. We met Imam Fainke. Fainke also is from the Sarahule ethnic group, a group that does it 100%. And in that journey, he stood up and spoke in a very conservative society, a society where people only listen to religious scholars and moreover, his caste was also an issue. So there were multiple forces against him, but he stood and challenged all the scholars in that region. Through his advocacy and religious activism, working with us, he was able to break the taboo of silence. He told them, go and read and come back. I'm waiting for you. They went back to the book and came back. Many of them accepted. And that was where we had the first acceptance of change. The role of religious leader is clarify and sensitize people to say that if this practice is a danger for the individual, we should stop it. We have community-based radios who have constantly been collecting the voices of these scholars and playing it to the public, covering the whole region. You have the media, all sorts of media, both traditional media and the conventional media, coming in to bring in the message in the local languages. We talk in direct with the community, and we also call their imams, their religious leaders, to sensitize them, to talking with them. We don't impose our opinion to them. We ask them whether we are, they are agree with us or no. We don't condemn. We all learn through each other. Most of the women that we have been having discussions with told us that we did not know that our problems, our health problems were related to female genital mutilation. We had misconceptions, feeling that it was a religious injunction we felt that to become a Mandinka woman or a Fula woman, a Jola woman or a Sarahule woman, you have to be caught. This is what we were born into and nobody really questioned why. But what we have seen and what you have shown us are things that we are living. And proudly say that the region is free from female genital mutilation. A whole region has come out in their numbers, young and old, men and women, far and wide, to come and celebrate themselves, to come and celebrate the results of our advocacy, and to come and celebrate their circumcisers who are the custodians of female genital mutilation. Dropping the knife is an event where we come together to say no to FGM in public, in the presence of the community leaders. If you watch them going round the mat, they were praying and swearing to themselves that they will never go back to the knife to hurt any other child in the name of culture. The Quran inspires to revolt. But the Quran does not inspire to revolt over the bodies of others. وَلَوْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِكُمْ Even though this may be against yourself. When men stand up for justice, it must be against ourselves. You grow up as a man, you grow up thinking that to be a man means to be in a relationship over a woman.
men who, who are privileged, you know, don't want change because why would they want change when the status quo privileges them um, and treats them special? Men must have the will to have less, less power, less control, less privilege, less authority. It's not simply a question of giving women a hand up. I often use this analogy about a car where uh, Muslims often speak about, um, oh, we're generous, we're gentle, we're charming, uh, we do the appropriate thing, so I open the car door for my wife. No, the Islamic question of justice is, who owns the car? Can your wife own the car? Can your wife drive the car? Can she determine where she's going instead of being the recipient of your kindness and your generosity all the time? She is an autonomous human being. For me, Islam and feminism are very much compatible because for me, feminism is the quest for justice in a just world. And that is also for me what Islam is. Feminists acknowledge the equality between men and women, firstly. Secondly, acknowledges that it's not simply between men and women, but between all of humankind, regardless of their gender, or regardless of the shadows, or the lack of clarity. In the case of intersexuality, for example, the lack of clarity around uh, genders. Islamic law has always recognized the existences of individuals who for various biological or deeply psychological reasons do not feel comfortable expressing themselves entirely in male or female terms. Islam means that I am a, a human being worthy of uh, recognition and to be treated equal. Islam means to me that I am at peace with myself and my family and my creator. Ce que j'aime dans l'islam, c'est la spiritualité. Et cette spiritualité, c'est euh, la transcendance. C'est la relation directe avec Dieu. On n'a pas de clergé, on n'a pas d'intermédiaire. C'est une relation amoureuse, vraiment une relation profonde, amoureuse, qui nous fait aimer le monde entier, l'univers, les êtres humains, quelle que soit leur religion, leur non-religion, quel que soit leur sexe, quelle que soit leur race, quelle que soit leur identité. Our voice and our experience are sources of authority in defining and understanding what Islam is and what it's not and how Islamic law is going to be used um, to govern our lives. You know, the political leaders are not going to like hand you um, reform and equality and justice on a silver platter. You have to fight for it. What it requires is for women to engage. We need people to be constructively engaged with their religion to understand some of the factors or the traditions or practices that are justified in the name of religion, which are actually discriminatory. We cannot violate the spirit of justice and human dignity and fairness. We need to go back to the origins of these ideas, to the Quran and Sunnah, and give it an understanding, interpretation that is fair and just. We are not challenging Islam, we are not challenging Quran. We are saying go back and read Quran, but read it with, with justice, with equality, with human dignity in mind. And this is a feminist discourse, but it is also one that is deeply rooted in the Quranic ethos of equality.